your, this is the opening structure of Genesis 1. The opening structure of Genesis 1 is very stylized. And these zeros that you're seeing is like a representation of the Hebrew words themselves. So you'll see exactly seven. There's, six, there's three, one in the middle, three on the other side, there's seven. Then you got 14, which is seven, and seven. And then you got this six day structure in the middle. Um, the very opening segment in the beginning, when God was creating the skies and the land, the land was indistinguishable and destitute, wild and waste, formless and void. Tohu vavohu. It had no shape, nothing to be able to distinguish one thing from another. So like chaotic. When you when you if you like have like a box of Skittles and you spill them, they're like all over and you're not distinguishing them, and then you organize them into reds and blues and greens, and then it's got order, right? This is a state where it's like indistinguishable. So these days are where he shapes and separates, creating distinction, right? But the other contrast is it's void, meaning it has no life. There's nothing doing anything in it. And so these are him filling and bringing function. Um, so, do you notice day one to day four correspond? Day two to day five correspond? Day, uh, day three to day six correspond? And then on this last, it's all talking about rest, God resting. But it's five segments of seven words. So I just bring that up to show you that the very first chapter is very curated... Um, stylized uh, picture and that in and of itself is a form of communication it's trying to tell you something I'm ordered I'm structured I have thought that has went into me I am I have a reason for being and I'm trying to communicate something and what is it all about it's about God bringing order and life and structure to a disordered and unstructured and lifeless reality. So I just want to point that out when you're reading. This stuff is probably never going to come through in the English translation, but it's, it's just really cool to know. Like, the person who wrote it was like, obviously if God is the author, but through the human author, he used his intellect and his, his brilliance to craft this. Right? And so, I just, I think it's worth noting. And um, this is just a Hebrew version of the same thing that color codes how everything coordinates. Anyway, that's just a fun um, <laughs> intro to the intro. When we open Genesis, and we read, the f who's here for the very, very first first class? Almost all of you guys, right? A few of you weren't. Um, <clears throat> the opening line. In the beginning, when God was creating the skies and the land, we went into that, in the Hebrew it says, Bereshit bara Elohim at the aretz. The word Bereshit, it gives you this idea of like, um, a very generalized throwback into the past. It's not like the very, very first thing that happened. It's like, it's the first in an order of things, you know, way back when things were happening. So, in the beginning, which beginning? When the skies and the land were being created. That beginning. And um, the word beginning, bara, can mean to create. And in Genesis specifically, Every time you use the word bara, it's attached to Yahweh. So it gives you this idea, the only person in creation, the only person in existence that does this word is Yahweh. So um, no other thing in the created order, baras, meaning creates in that way, right? So there's, there's that little note. But there's a homonym to the word bara, and it means to separate. And so I find that fascinating because 
how does God create in this account? He creates by separating and making distinction, right? And uh, <clears throat> just as a catch up on that, uh, this is more on the line of functional creation as opposed to material creation. The material creation is assumed, but it's not significant to the author. Of course, the person who formed and functioned everything made it all, but who cares about that? How does it work? Why does it work? And who made it work? That is the emphasis here. Why does the sun rise and set? Why does the tide go in and out? Why are the stars consistent and yet there's these moving ones that also move in a consistent pattern? Why does food grow? <laughs> who, who made these functions and who sustains that? And this is where all those ancient cosmologies come in because they're all trying to make a claim. You've got the Sumerians who are saying it's Enki and you've got the, you've got the Greeks who say it's Zeus. You've got the Mesopotamians who say it's Baal. You've got the Assyrians who say it's Marduk. They're all trying to make a claim. Who made all this? And this is where these creation narratives come out. So one of the first things you want to do when you're reading a book is ask yourself, <coughs> What am I reading? What kind of book am I reading? If you read a math book, it doesn't read the same as a science textbook or a, a psychology textbook or a philosophy textbook. So once you know what you're reading, then you know what your expectations are. You know the right questions to ask. You know how to immerse yourself in the world of that style of writing, right? When we're reading Genesis 1, we are reading a creation narrative. But we're not reading a modern creation narrative, we're reading an ancient creation narrative. Yeah? You follow? So I'm going to read just the first section, okay? In the beginning, when God was creating the skies and the land, now the land was indistinguishable and destitute, and darkness was over the face of the deep watery chaos, and the spirit, the wind, the breath of God was fluttering like a bird over the face of the waters. This is the opening scene before anything happens. Before God speaks, before creation happens, we have God assumed. He's not created. He's just assumed. We have uh, the watery, chaotic depths and darkness present. We don't know when they were there. They're just, they're just there at the beginning. You have um, the land but it's completely covered in water there, assumed. So there's three assumptions. God is present, and the, the heavens and the earth are technically like materially present, but they don't do anything. They're not valuable, right? Now I'm gonna read to you something from one of the ancient Near Eastern texts. This is called, where are we at here? Stories of Andrew What are the three assumptions? The hymn of Atum. You gotta speak loud and proud. I, I so can't hear it. What are the three assumptions? You said there's three. Well, the one assumption, first and foremost, is God is is not created. Mm -hmm. He's just God exists. Okay? But the other thing you'll notice, has God spoken yet? He hasn't spoken yet. And how does the creation account say God created? Spoke. He speaks. But the heavens and the earth are there, and the watery chaos is there, and darkness is there. Has God spoken yet? How long has that been there for? We don't know yet. But in the beginning, when God began to create things, this was the state of that at that time. So like I said, we're not talking about material creation of like, how many years ago did this happen? Well, it doesn't say, because it's just... God's saying, when I started to approach the canvas, it was blank. He's not saying, you know, 50 years ago I made a canvas. I went and cut down a tree. I shaped the wood. I got the, uh, the, the cotton. I threaded it. I made canvas material. I stretched it. I got my canvas ready. It's not telling us that. It's saying, when I began to start working on my canvas, this is the story. <laughs> right? Um, Hymn of Atum. Okay, this is <coughs> an ancient Near Eastern text that is, what do you call that, a neighbor? 
a contemporary to the book of Genesis. And then what I want you to hear is things that are similar and things that are different. Because they're born into the same world, they have the same ideas floating in their head. But there's, there's some similarities and there's some major differences. And uh, here we go. <clears throat> this is an Egyptian one, by the way. At the moment of creation, Atum spoke, I alone am creator. When I came into being, all life in turn began to develop. When the mighty speaks, all else comes to life. When there was no heavens and no earth, when there was no dry land and no reptiles, worms, or insects in the land, when I first began to plan their creation before there was a place to stand, I alone began to plan and design. Before I sneezed, shoo, the wind. Before I spat, to not, the rain. There was not a single living creature. I planned many living creatures, and all were in my heart. Their children and their children's children. Now this is where it's for mature audiences only. Then I copulated with my own fist. I masturbated with my own hand. I ejaculated into my own mouth and sneezed to create shoe the wind and spat to create tufnut um, the rain. Nun, my sea father, reared them. I, my sun mother, looked after them. In the beginning, I was alone, and then there were three more. I dawned over the land of Egypt. Shoe the wind and toughen up the rain played on noon the sea. Having created my divine companions, my eye wept and human beings appeared. Having emerged from isolation, I created reptiles, worms, and insects. Shu and Tufnut gave birth to Geb, the earth, and Nut, the sky. Geb and Nut gave birth to Osiris, Isis, Seth, and Nephthys. Osiris and Isis gave birth to Horus. One was born right after the other, and these nine, or Greek, the Aeneid, gave birth to everything on the earth. This is an Egyptian creation account. This is how... So, what do you notice that's similar, and what do you know that's very different? Yes? Um, the first thing I noticed was how, in this story, um, their God declared himself right away. It was the first person to the him declare himself. But, um, and you see, like, how in Genesis, right, he didn't speak until... Or what do you call it? When he said... When, when things were being created, right? Then God spoke, then God spoke, so on and so forth, right? And so, yeah. Right. His the first thing he speaks is himself. So, yeah. Right. He creates himself. Like, but so that he's... This, this particular deity wasn't and then was because he created himself so Yahweh just exists he's just pure existence in and of itself he's the source and ground of all being that's one thing to know but do you hear material creation in this like really the wind and the sky and, and this and that it just seems to me to talk about yes there's some material aspect to it but it doesn't seem to be concerned with that in a scientific way, right? More like a functional one. That's just, I'm trying to, I'm trying to say that I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> I'm not, not making this up. I'm just like, this is where we're getting that idea from, right? Then you've got another guy who comes along and says, this is another Egyptian creation account, because Egyptians weren't monolithic. They didn't all think the same thing. They even had competing deities in Egypt. And another thing to note is creation narratives were usually made for the purpose of establishing the, the basis for why their land existed and basis for their kings to have authority and the basis for like, like say, let's say Canada had a creation myth. It's like, it's like, why does Canada exist? Well, here's our myth. And the states would be like, well, here's our myth. So that's kind of the reason they did these in a lot of ways. So the Genesis narrative is to signify our God is the true God. And Israel has a right to this land because our God created the whole earth. And if he wants to take, he can take. If he wants to give, he can give. And that's why we're here. It was their apologetic, so to speak. Right? And... and at that time, that's just what people did. They gave an apologetic for their nation states. So, <clears throat> this one. When Ged assembled the Ennead, 
to end the wars between Horus and Seth, the divine patron of the earth. Yeah. No, I want to skip ahead. Aha! Ptah. Him to Ptah. Ptah created the Ennead, like a scribe writing a hieroglyphic image. All living things were designed first in the heart and then named in the tongue. The godfather Horus was created from the thoughts of Ptah's heart. The godfather Thoth was formed by the words of Ptah's tongue. Ptah's heart guides the Ennead. Ptah's tongue directs humans, animals, and reptiles. Ptah creates the Ennead with only teeth and lips. Atum created with hands and semen. Atum had to masturbate to bring forth the Ennead. Ptah only had to speak, and the Ennead came forth. Ptah called the names of Shur and Tufnut. In turn, the godmother of the wind and the godfather of the rain gave birth to the Ennead. Sight, hearing, smell report to the heart, and the heart is the source of all knowledge. The tongue speaks only what the heart thinks. Atum and the Ennead think only the thoughts of Ptah. Atum and the Ennead speak only the words of Ptah. Ptah's heart grants the gifts of life. I keep going, but this gives you the idea of like, they're like, so you see similarities and you see differences. There's this one who had to do some crazy junk to make this thing work. This other guy speaks to create other creatures to create. In contrast, in Genesis, God is alone. Uh, there are other accounts like the Enumi Elish, which is the Babylonian one, where they have to fight and create violence in order to create. So you've got sex and violence as the basis for their creation. In this next one in the creation uh, story of humanity, I'm just gonna skip ahead and just give you the Coles notes. They have a divine council meeting because all the gods have created stuff and they're tired of working and they want slave labor. They're like, we don't wanna work for our food. Let's create other things to create our food. Okay, good, what are we gonna do? Well, let's make humans. How are we gonna do that? Okay, we're gonna appoint this guy to die, and we're gonna kill him, and we're gonna mix his blood with clay, and we're gonna shape these humans by a mix of divine blood, divine breath, and clay, and they'll be our slaves, and they will bring us our food, and they will serve us. That was the creation. So what's similar? Similar to the creation account, humans are dirt. And we're created, there's an aspect of divine nature in humanity, but are we slaves in the creation narrative of Genesis? What are we? We're kings. We are dirt and divine breath who are created into God's image, made into God's image, which means we are regent rulers of Yahweh in his good world. So the high status, this is actually one thing I want to say, the high status of humanity is amazing. Anyway, these are, I just wanted to give you a bit of background to know what kind of world Genesis was born into, right? It was not the first one written. These ones predate it. Um, these predate the Genesis accounts. And so... What's happening here is you have Israel come on the scene. Babylon's already established. Egypt's already established. Mesopotamia's already established. And then Abraham shows up. <laughs> right? So you know that he's not the first one. And if we're going to take Mosaic authorship, well, he's, now we're going a thousand years from Abraham. So if we're taking Mosaic authorship for Genesis, it's definitely not the first one. Right? But it's within a cultural milieu. It's got a particular style of writing. It's got a particular way of communicating. It's got a particular agenda it wants to put forward. And so what Genesis 1, in part, is attempting to do is also be a, a polemic against its neighbors. You guys say Baal is king. We say Yahweh is. Here's our proof. Right? And that's one facet. I'm not saying this is the whole facet. This is one facet of it. Anyway. Let's carry on. How are you guys doing, by the way? Good. Yeah, good? Okay. <clears throat> All right. I, got, I told you guys about the Tehom, right? The Tehom, that's the deep chaos waters, separates them. All right. And God said, let there be light. 
and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. So, in the past, light wasn't thought of as like photons and waves and particles. It was like this phenomenon that existed, but didn't have a source. They didn't think of the sun as the thing that causes light. The reason they didn't think that is because the sunrise happens before the sun shows up. So they had this idea of like, well, light is a thing, right? And so in this account, God is making light and it's contrasting it with darkness. Does God get rid of the darkness? He separates it and gives it a space. Now, if we take the idea, let's just make for an assumption as a thought experiment. We take the idea that the chaos waters and darkness are elements of chaos that God just speaks to and overcomes. He doesn't fight it. He doesn't do anything. Does he get rid of the chaos? If we assume that it means chaos, does he get rid of it? But he contains it, right? He gives it a space. You can't go any further. You go here, now light is here. And then God said, let there be a dome, a rakia, in the midst of the waters, between them, to separate the waters from the waters. And God made the dome and separated the waters which were under the dome from the waters which were above the dome, and it was so. And God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. Um... This goes also back to ancient cosmology where they had a tiered universe. You had these chaos waters, the Tahom, and then God separates them, and then he holds them back. And then he creates a space inside of that realm to bring life. What did he do with the darkness? He separated it and created a space inside where there was light. Yeah? In the same way, the waters were all over, and he separated it, and he creates a space in it for the potential of life. Yeah? Then God said, Let the waters under the skies be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. And God called the dry ground land. And the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the land produce vegetation. Plants yielding seeds and trees on the land bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation. Plants yielding seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and it was evening, and there was morning a third day. Now we begin to see something. When God creates light and contrasts it with darkness, he calls it good. On the third day, God separates the waters off of the land, puts vegetation on it, and he calls it good. Did you notice that the good formula is missing on day two? He separates it, but it's still not useful for life. Nothing can live there, so it's not good yet. But the fact that he creates a space for something to inhabit, it becomes good. Yeah? And God said, let there be, oh, this is where we're getting, we've done three days of shaping and bringing function and bringing separation. We're creating spaces, yeah? We have three days of creating spaces. Now what is God going to do with said spaces? What happens in day one? Contrasting light and darkness, right? Here's day three. Or day four, sorry. And God said, Let there be lamps in the domes of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and symbols and for ritual feast times and for days and for years. And let them serve as lights in the domes of the sky to give light on the land. And it was so. And God made the two great lamps, the greater lamp to rule over the day and the lesser lamp to rule over the night and the stars. God placed the lamps in the dome of the skies to shine on the land, to preside over the day and over the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, a fourth day. Yeah? Now, you may find it interesting. Why does it have the word lamps? 
It has the word lamp. Oh, it's, it's a rabbit trail. But it, it's talking about the menorah in the temple. Like, it's using the word for the menorah in the temple. It's, it's intentionally not using the word sun and moon. Because even in Hebrew, the word for sun and moon were also names for deities. Hamesh and Sin were names for the sun and the moon. And we're like, well, we're not going to say sun and moon because people are going to think that we deify these things. So rather than do that, they just made an intentional break and called them lamps, right? That was one of the reasons for it, to just make a quick distinction. Hey, we don't think that these things are actually like gods. We think that Yahweh made them. But it's interesting that even though these things are creatures, we don't think of them as sentient. It's interesting, though, that the scripture calls them to rule. God gave what he did. He's the one who separates light and dark. He's the one who, who gives light and holds back darkness. And what does God do? He appoints the sun and the moon to carry that task. God delegates. God is a giver. So God is able to do it, willing to do it, but then says, you know what? I'm going to share. So now he delegates that responsibility to the sun, moon, and stars. <clears throat> when it says it's for signs and symbols and feast days, in your most English translations, you'll have seasons. The word is mo'adim. Mo'adim in Hebrew is a Levitical term for what your feast times are going to be. You've got Yom Kippur, you've got the Passover, you've got the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you've got the Feast of Trumpets, you've got Shabbat. You've got all these feasts that revolve around the agricultural year of which Israel was supposed to revolve their life around in focus of how God is providing for them in every way. It's their whole history lived out ritually in a yearly calendar. It's we were rescued from Egypt. Now God fed us in the desert. And then he made us live in tents. And he caused us to walk into the land. We blew trumpets to make Jericho fall. Their whole history lived out every single day. Like every week, Shabbat. It's a reminder of this story. You know, every year you've got Yom Kippur. You've got the Passover. You've got all these things. It's a constant reminder in their national life. This is who we are. This is where we came from. But God, in, in, the, in the book of Genesis, is like, why does he appoint the stars? Well, so we can figure out what those days are. <laughs> right? Because remember, this is the introduction to the Bible. Right? So it, it's relevant to the Bible. The other thing for signs. What does a sign do? If I showed you... I didn't even bring it. It directs you. Hmm? Direction. Direction. It's giving you direction. Like a map. Well, oh, sign. Yeah, sign. Direction. But another thing would be... Okay, Pepsi. Let's say you're driving and you see a Pepsi symbol. Mm -hmm. Is that symbol the actual thing? No. It indicates right. something else. Yeah. And you can identify it. But the real product is, you know, a brown liquid that tastes good. If you like that kind of thing. Right? Um, these stars and moon and sun were also called signs. For what? What are these bright shining things in the sky that dictate order and have some element of designated authority? What are these signs for? Well, at the very end of chapter 1, God says that he created all their hosts or armies. Sabot. Every time this word is mentioned all through the Psalms and the prophets, it's referring both to the stars and the entire angelic hosts that serve God. So these are signs for seasons and etc., etc., but they're signs for something beyond them. There is... A reality beyond them that points to something. Like these point to a reality behind them. God is up and he's above everything. And look at his vast 
attendants. He is high king, and look how many things serve him. These bright ones, these powerful ones, and these things that have authority. So they were signs for what we would basically call an angelic host, spiritual realm. So it's hard for us to look at the stars and go, oh yeah, that's an angel, <laughs> right? We don't think like that. And I'm convinced that maybe Israel didn't think directly like that. But they understood significance behind things. That's not just a star, right? We're not talking just about the ocean. Oh, my battery ran out. You, do you follow me? Okay. I'm gonna just switch this battery out, forgive me, because everything went quiet, really quiet. Are we back? I'm back. Okay, here we go. Now we're going to move on to the next day. And God said, Let the waters swarm with living creatures and let winged creatures fly above the land across the face of the dome of the skies. And God created the great sea serpents, dragons, and every living thing that swarms with which the waters swarmed according to their kinds, and every winged flyer according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them. He said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the water and the seas and let the flyers multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. Okay, we touched base on this the very first class. Um, I don't have verses and stuff written. If anybody has a translation of the Bible, flip to Genesis chapter 1, verse, like in the fifth day. Go to the fifth day. And you might find, and God created the great sea creatures or the whales or something to that effect. I want to hear what you guys just says. Mine says, so God created the great creatures of the sea. Okay. Every living thing. Okay. What this else do we have? King James says, God created great whales and every living creature. The great whales. Which the waters brought forth abundantly. Okay. After their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God okay. saw that it was good. So the great creatures. What does yours say? Sea God monsters. created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves. What translation is yours? A new American standard. The great sea monsters, that probably the most accurate one so far. What's your say, Spiro? Oh, the first uh, verse. Uh, in the it's fifth day. Verse uh, 21. 21. Yeah. Chapter 1. Okay. And God created the great sea whales and every living creature that Great moves. whales. Yeah. Okay, that's it. The word is tanin. Tanin. And the great tanin. When Moses was told to throw down the snake, or throw down his staff, and it became a snake, there's two words used. There's the word nachash, which means serpent, and there's another word, tanim. When he throws his staff down, it becomes a snake, and then God says, reach out your hand and grab the tanim and pick it up. So we're to think of a serpentine, reptilian creature here. Okay? God creates the tanim, the great tanim. Well, why would it? Why is this detail here? Let's follow the train of thought. Just enter into the biblical world for a second, and you've got darkness, which represents chaos. You've got water, which represents chaos, and God separates them and puts them in their world, in their realm. You can go here and no further. The Tanin, according to these other ancient cosmologies. One was called Rahav, one was called Livyatan, one was called Tiamat. These were great sea serpents, dragons that represented uh, the ocean, the raging chaos ocean, that the gods had to slay in order to create. The gods had to kill the chaos monster, and from the body of the chaos monster, they made the skies and the land. What is if we're following that train of thought, then what is this tanin? It's, it's chaos. And God is saying, it's my pet, and it has a home, and it's dangerous, and it'll kill you without a thought. But it's still part of my good world over there. Not on the land, 
where humans will flourish. But out there, it has a place. So God separates it and says, you can go here and no further. Now, if we jump all the way to the book of Job, Job is basically saying, the whole book of Job is exploration on, on the wisdom of God and is this world run on justice? If you do good, do you get good? If you do bad, do you get bad? Proverbs gives you this positive idea of like, yep, this is how things roll. Ecclesiastes complicates it, says mm -mm, not so much. And Job says definitely not. There's something else at work. In the end, Job is complaining. He wants an audience with God. And God, in one of his answers, is like, what, do you, what can you do about Leviathan? What can you do about him? Is he your pet? Is he going to listen to you? What are you going to do about it? Are you going to fight him? He'll, he'll kill you without a thought. He's mentioning this thing right here. The Tanin HaGedolim. He's saying, there are things in this world that don't make sense and they're more dangerous and far greater than you possibly imagine. But what does he say about the Leviathan? He goes, he listens to me, no problem. No problem. I don't have to fight it in order to create. I speak and I create. And guess what? I made that too. So there's an element of God's good world that still has a raw, a wild, a dangerous element to it that for God's purposes and in his wisdom is necessary at this time. Now I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. Okay? Whenever there's depictions throughout the Psalms and the Prophets of God's throne, it's upon a sea that is still and clear as crystal or glass. If God's throne is depicted of being above the chaos waters of the sky, and yet when He rules on them, they're still. What is that trying to communicate? It's, there's no chaos around Him. Everything is in control and it's still. And in the end of Revelation, what does it say about the state of the new heavens and the new earth? Does anybody know? There are no seas. There is no sea. Does that mean you can't go surfing? Or is there something more significant to what that is? In light of the way my train of thought is going, if there's no sea in the new creation, it means chaos is not even an element at all in God's good creation. There's going to be nothing that is wild and dangerous and hostile toward life. You will be completely free and the world will be not dangerous. Everything will have so much harmony and so much control. There's no chaos. That's what it says of the new heaven and the new earth. But we're not there yet. We're still in a world that doesn't make sense sometimes. And that every turn, if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, Things just will kill you. A snake will still bite you. You'll still die. You jump off a cliff, you still fall. You go into the ocean, you still drown. You put your hand in fire, you still get burned. Sometimes stuff happens. This is what Job is complaining about. Like, why does stuff just happen? And what is God's response? I'm in control of everything. You trust me and my wisdom. And you'll be all right. Yeah? So I just wanted to bring that up because I think it's sad that got translated um, as whales. I find that sad that that wasn't brought out because now Revelation makes no sense and Job makes no sense and the Psalms make no sense if it's just a whale or just a sea creature. But if we take the what the significance of that creature entails we go, oh, this is talking about the chaotic elements of things. And then you go, oh, wait, now I'm beginning to see when, when in, the, in the book of Isaiah, God slays Rahav. Oh, that makes sense when he stands over the oceans and its calms. Oh, that makes sense of God slaying the great Jang in a revelation. Oh, that makes sense that there's no sea in the new heaven and the new earth. The thread goes all the way through. And you're like, this is brilliant. I love the word of God because it's so cool. The whole thing's been threaded together like it was done on purpose. You know, through like 
40 different authors in three different languages written on three different continents over a period of 1600 years and it's all saying the same thing. Wow, that's pretty cool. I think maybe God wrote it. <laughs> that's why I find this stuff important to come to the fore and my personal little annoyances when it doesn't. Right? I just appear as I guess. So I think that's cool. But aside from that, you could probably still take it and bet, yeah, he also made whales and the Kraken and whatever else he got in there, crazy dangerous animals, and all the little fishies and the creatures and the crabs and whatnot. He made everything, right? We're not denying that. And he created the flyers. Now the reason I didn't translate it as birds is because the flyers aren't talking about just birds. It's talking about the mechanics of a creature that uses wings. Are birds the only thing in our cosmos that have wings? No. What else has wings? Bats. Bats? Insects. Insects? Dragons. Dragons? Dragons, yeah. <laughs> so, God is basically saying anything that lifts itself off the ground, mm -hmm. that's what he's talking about. So if you say birds, you're not wrong, but it's not full. Does that make sense? So that's why I chose to just do flyers because it just it encompasses everything that flies. And God said, "Let the land produce." Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is great. Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. What did God do for the sun and the moon and the stars in day four? He delegated authority. Something that God alone does, but he shares it with one of his creatures, right? What does he now do for the land? Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. Yeah? <coughs> Cattle, low-crawling things, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the wild animals according to their kind, and the cattle according to their kind, and all the creatures that creep along the ground according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. So, the way I read this, you might see something more significant, but what's significant to me is that there seems to be a partnering. God's like, I'm going to let you do it, and that's me doing it. It's, it's kind of like, let the water swarm with living creatures, and God made the living creatures. So it's giving you this, God is working with the world he's creating to create. Yeah? Now this is where it gets even better because he does it again. And God said, not asa adam, but said, many people tend. Let us make humanity in our image and in our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, flyers of the air, and over all the cattle, and over all the land, and over all the creatures that move on the land. So God created the human in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them, and God blessed them, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the land and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the, the waters and the flyers and the skies and every creature that moves on the ground. So God partners again. He creates this little dirt creature, and he says, Rule. So I find fascinating. God, again, loves to give. He's delegating authority. Could God easily rule everything, especially since he makes the tanin? Like, yeah, he's got it in the bag, man. He's king. But he's like, yeah, but you rule. The amount of God's self-security is astounding, where he can take little <laughs> dirt creatures and say, rule my whole world. Yes, that's awesome. I love it. Okay, now I'm going to just pause at the nature of humanity here. Let us make humanity in our salam. This might, I hope this doesn't offend you, but this is just what it says. Let's make humanity our idol statue. That's what the word salam means. A salam was something that people would place all over the land to represent either their kings or their deities. This is what idolatry was, when people would create these little statues and bow down to them and say, you, a piece of wood I just made and carved and covered in gold, you are my God. God says, 
Don't you dare do that. Don't you dare do that. Why? Well, first reason is God is invisible. And everything you even can imagine to make would insult him. Yeah? Secondly, I already made my own idol. It's you. Why? Because God is the living God. He is the living God. So he made a creature that can see and hear and taste and touch and breathe and move. It's a walking animated statue. How much closer to the living God can you get except having a moving, breathing, living thing? Who now rules like God rules. He is, humanity is the walking, breathing expression of the invisible God. Not God's. You are not gods. You're not little gods, little Elohim, like that kind of whacked out theology. You are his image. But that's enough. That is enough. Because you are the walking embodiment of God's will on this world. You're like, oh, God, look at all the poor people. What are you going to do about it? Oh, image? <laughs> what about this thing happening? What are you going to do about it? Oh, image? And God says, I'm going to rescue Israel out of Egypt. Moses, get to her. <laughs> right? Because God, his MO is, I'm going to rule the world through people. Whatever I do in this world is going to be through you. Heck, how do we get the Bible? Who is Jesus? The epitome of what it means to be the image of God. The word icon is the Greek word that is equivalent to the Hebrew Salem. Icon was the Greek word for idol. Images. And it says Jesus is the express image of God. And we are made in the image of Christ. Do you feel the connection? If humans are supposed to be the physical embodiment of God's authority in this world, and Jesus is the perfect example of what that means. What he's really saying is Jesus is the only one who's truly human. He's the only one who truly, truly embodies heaven and earth in one. We are dirt and divine breath. We are dirt made from the earth and God breathed his spirit into us and became a living being, yeah? And yet Jesus is God himself who just put skin on. You can't get more of heaven than that. Right? You follow? Anyway, how are we doing? <laughs> 10 o'clock. Okay, let's just finish this one up. Where did I go? Oh. See, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of all the land. And every tree that has fruit with its seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all animals of the land, and to every flyer in the skies, and to all creatures that move on the ground, everything that has living breath in it, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so, and God saw all that he had made. And look, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, a sixth day. Thus was completed the skies and the land with all their hosts or armies. Thus was completed on the seventh day all the work that God had accomplished. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had accomplished. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, distinct, unique. Because on it he ceased from all the work that God created to shame. Here's another important thing. If God is eternal and he can inexhaustibly speak everything into existence and can... Keep, element, uh, keep chaos as an element still within his creation and have absolute control over it at all times. And other scriptures say that God doesn't sleep and that nothing's too difficult for him. Does God need rest? Does he need rest? Okay. Here's something that's cool. In ancient Near East texts, the only time a deity rests is on his throne in his temple. In other words, they rest on their throne. When you rest on your throne, are you sleeping? What 
are you doing? Relaxing. What? Relaxing. Louder. Relaxing. Relaxing. Nah. Ruling. Say it again. Ruling. Louder. Ruling. When you're resting on your throne, you're ruling. So what is it saying? The entire cosmos is God's home. The entire cosmos is his temple. And in it, he sits and rules. So God is high king over his creation. Yahweh is high king. In fact, it doesn't even say Yahweh yet. This whole thing is saying, this Elohim, this non-physical entity did all these things and he ruled. And now the burning question is, who is it? Who is the one that created all these things? And who is it that rules? And then the next line is, and Yahweh God created. <laughs> now go, that guy. He's the one that rules. So, when it says that God rests on the seventh day from his work, it's not rest without activity. It's rest in terms of there's no opposition to his rule. There's no opposition to what he wants to accomplish in his world that he made. And he has the right to do it. Yeah? Now here's the other cool thing. I'm going to jump again to Exodus. Why are humans told to not rest? Or sorry, why are humans told to rest? Physically rest, like sleep rest, and not do any activity on Shabbat? Because in six days God created the skies and the land, and on the seventh day he rested. We would think, well, we should rest like God. No, 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 no. We rest because he rules. We don't need to work because he's in control. We don't need to stress about our food because he's got that business handled. He knows what he's doing. Because God is king, we can relax. Because our world and our life does not depend on us and what we can do and what we can accomplish and what we can achieve. It depends on God who gave us breath and God who's in control of everything all the time. Because He is King, I can be at peace. Because He rules, I can relax. Because He is Lord, I can be lazy today. That is why. And that is why Jesus says, do not worry about what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear. Because God knows you need these things. Just seek Him in His kingdom. And this will be added as well. Do you understand? We are at 10 o'clock. We just finished the first chapter. Um, Q&R, 15 minutes. Anything? Yes, Tenny. So, does all the breeds suggest like a flat earth? Like, where do you stand on that? Sorry, you got to say that again. So, like, based on what we've read, would you, like, what do you, like, what do you think of, okay, I guess, like, the modern creation narrative which is like the big bang evolution oh, and like the my, my stance first and foremost is the bible doesn't speak to that i don't like yeah. that's my first stance um it's like god communicates let me let me go here the question is <laughs> how do i view modern cosmology in light of what we've just learned and my answer is i don't think the bible's speaking to modern cosmology it's talking to the people who it's talking to. The Bible wasn't written to us. It was written for us, but it's not written to us. Now, does it make sense for God, who's approaching a people who have an ancient cosmology, to tell them, hey, by the way, I'm going to talk to you in terms that you're not going to understand for the next six to 10,000 years, and only for that small window of time, and it might change after that? Does that make sense? No, for sure. So God's going to speak to people how they understood the world. And how they said, the sky's blue. Why? Because well, there's water up there. Why? Because it rains. Like, that's just how they saw the world. And so God, using how they perceived reality, was like, yeah, I'm the one who made the sky ocean. And I'm the one who made this, the water ocean and the land that floats on pillars. That's me. Now, here's the question. If you believe that, does it change who God is and what he's capable of as your understanding of cosmology changes? No. no. If God reigns over the sky waters and over the like waters in the ground, well, God reigns over the ozone layer and outer space. It doesn't change how I view the world. 
What I believe about Yahweh actually just got bigger. Holy! There's an endless universe out there. Talk about separating into chaos waters. You made the Rukia. Look at, look, think about this for a second. This is so cool. Chaos waters in ancient cosmology are just this big mass of hostile things. And then he creates a space inside of it to create life to flourish. What is a modern version of that? Oh, I don't know, like outer space? And he creates a space inside of it called planet Earth in which it can cultivate life and flourish. That's, for me, my, my, my cosmology just shifts. And I don't have to... I don't have to, to be bound to what they thought the world looked like. That's why I'm coming to terms with them and saying, okay, oh, hey, you know what? This is how you saw the world. I'm going to enter into your world. And from your perspective, this is what the world was like and how it worked. And this is how God was in relationship to everything. Now I'm going to go back to my world and go, oh, you know what? <laughs> we sent a shuttle to the moon and we look back and... The world doesn't have an ocean covering it. God's throne isn't on top of that. So physically, it's different than we knew before. But it doesn't change the reality that God is still king. It doesn't change the underlying concept that if you go into outer space, trust me, it's going to kill you. It's hostile. It doesn't take away from the fact that earth is literally separate from outer space and can contain life. It doesn't take away from the fact that there's an element inside of that little globe that has an element that wants to kill you. That God still has control over. Do you see, like, my world just expanded. God didn't, ex well, God expanded in the sense of he's even greater than I thought. So, I don't personally, for me, I do not believe in, in flat earth. And I, and I don't believe that you can bring the Bible, my opinion, I don't believe you can bring it to our modern debates and say the Bible says this because let's just think for a second if you want to get literal okay well God created humans and he created the whole heavens and earth in six days therefore evolution bad oh really because we just read in day six let the earth bring forth living creatures and we just read about how God partners with his creation to bring about creation so I think it just proves evolution. So you could do that. Like, you could just pick one. Pick your argument, and the Bible can prove it. So, how about we just don't? <laughs> Why don't we just let the Bible be the Bible? And say, how about we enter its world and stop forcing it into ours? Why don't we step into its reality and stop making it become our reality? Because, trust me, when you learn what it's saying on its own terms, it translates way better. Way better. It translates to... Now, and here's the other thing. Here's the cool thing. If you believe in a young earth, and you believe in evolution, you can be friends. Because it's like, you know what? God's king. And the Bible, throughout the whole scripture, says the earth declares the glory of the Lord. And it also says that... Um, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out. And it talks so much about the earth speaking of God's glory. So if you want to be obedient to scripture, go talk to the planet. Hey, tell me your story. Right? And in the book of Psalms, chapter 8, wisdom is said to have frolicked on the earth long before humans got there. It's like, wait a second, I thought he made everything in six days. How could you frolic on earth long before humans got there when just it was like two days? So that's what happens when you try and um, make everything concordist. Right? Now, the other problem, I'm personal, this is my personal issue, very personal issue, I take major issue with certain Christian groups that think a hyper-literal view of scripture has to be modern and therefore demonize other Christians. Right? Who say, because you don't believe this, you don't take God's word seriously. Because you don't believe this, you don't, you don't really believe in God. Like, I, I have no patience for that kind of ideology. None. And so, you can be free to disagree with me. Right? Disagree with me. I'm not a scientist. 
If you ask me if I believe in evolution, I don't care. I just don't care. I just don't care. Because I'm not a scientist. I don't care. Do I believe God can do whatever he wants? Heck yeah. Do I believe that's what the earth is telling me? Not so fast. But I'm not, I don't have an opinion. I seriously don't have an opinion. I'm a theologian. I'll let the science people do their science stuff. But if I'm going to argue for that, I have to argue it on their terms. And if they want to say, well, the Bible is bad because it doesn't line up with science, I'd be like, of course it doesn't line up with science. So here, here's an example. You take, how did I, I boiled water, okay, put the kettle on, I boil a whole bunch of water, and we gather a whole bunch of scientists around, and they can tell you about, about the physics and the mechanics and the science behind that. Oh, the, the atoms speed up because the heat's agitating the molecules, and they break the surface tension, and boom, it starts to boil. And that's their answer. And I'm like, no, stupid, I want a cup of tea. <laughs> so which one's right? There's nothing wrong with having two explanations. One is agency and purpose. The other is functionality. So a scientist can easily look at stuff and say, this is how things go. But they can't tell you why. And they can pretend to tell you why, but they would be wrong. Yeah? yeah. A scientist can say, there's no such thing as God because lightning is just a couple of electrons like doing this and zap. It's like, no, you idiot. God wants lightning. <laughs> right? It's like, that's why. So, forgive me the harsh expressions, but you, you can't, you don't, how do I say this? Neither one of these groups can speak to the other with any sort of authority. Mm -hmm. They have their world, and they should just stay in it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, if you're a flat earther, by all means be one, but on what grounds? My, my suggestion is don't bring the Bible into it, you'll be fine. If you do it for scientific reasons, well, then you've got a whole other battle to deal with the scientists. Right? My biggest thing is let's not make the Bible something it's not. It's not a science book. It's not a science book. It's God's word to humanity for what are you, who are you, why are you, who am I, how am I in relation to you, and all of this. Why is the world so amazing, and why is it so amazingly crazy at times? And why do people die? And why do we hate death? And who's dealing with that? And why is there sin? And why are humans who are so, one time so amazing so brutal and evil? And is anybody doing something about that? Well, the Bible is that book. It's that book that answers those questions that really affect us. Yeah? Did that answer your question at all? Is it helpful at all? Okay. So, I just took like five minutes for that. Okay, one more, and then we can clean up. No more. Okay. How you guys doing? You good? I feel like though, that kind of question, I think those are those make me scared when I hear questions. Because I'm afraid you'll be offended. I don't want you guys to be offended at my thoughts. I just... I want to honor the scriptures on their own terms. That's my thing. And so I think the whole debate about young earth, old earth, literal versus symbolic, all that, I think are the wrong questions. And I think it's right to just come to the Bible with its assumptions. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. After, it is something so much crazy against scientists, but aren't there lots of Christian scientists who are out trying to disprove the theory of evolution? Yeah, and there's Christian science. And, they have, and there is a lot of evidence where they... So that is for some people who are interested in that. Yeah, like BioLogos, the guy who split the human genome, uh, he's a Christian, full-out Christian, but full-out evolutionist. Joshua Swamidas, but there are a other, geneticist, full-out evolutionist. Yeah, and then you have other scientists who, who believe that evolution is bunk. So yeah, let them have their fun. I just... What I don't like is when... They bring the Bible into it, and when they demean somebody else's Christianity, yeah, it's because of bias. Yeah, There's I don't like the division. A, a good conversation, if that interests you. Yeah, and and those those questions are fun to have, but I'm not an expert in any of them. <laughs> yeah. Salvation. All right. Um, if there's no other questions, uh, we're gonna pack it up.
and we'll see you next week. Awesome. Yeah. yeah.